Um, okay, so you know, using imagery for methane detection, can we automate you know what's effectively now the state of the art or the standard technology? Um, and that's really what this is about. So here's a picture of my graduate students, uh, Jacob Englander and, and Jing Fan Wang, uh, both graduated now using our FLIR camera. Uh, and then here's an image of what, you know, a FLIR camera generates a stack here, event stack uh, is leaking some methane. And so that's what that looks like in the camera. Whole goal here is, can we take Jacob and, and Jing Fan out of the picture, get these images, analyze them and detect things in them without having a human in the loop? And I'll talk about why that's advantageous. I think you can get a 90 to 95% cost reduction. Okay, so, you know, introduction on methane emissions. You guys know this, I'll skip this in the interest of time. There's a lease of Canyon, you know, obligatory 30X GWP. Okay, um, you know, so uh, what's kind of the current standard in, in leak detection and repair? Uh, strategies. It's really an iterative uh, kind of sampling approach at not very high frequency, usually something like a three to six month sort of time frame. Canada has been talking about three times a year and really a find all fix all strategy. Um, if you find an issue, you're supposed to fix it within a certain uh, time frame. This is really the way policies in North America have been structured or structured then repealed, um, you know, as the case may be. But this is really the, the kind of mode. A lot of this comes from uh, actually has its genesis. If you look at the history, uh, in uh, refinery uh, detection and repair regulations starting in the 1970s using by one other point source of PPM measurements. So this is kind of an old uh, idea. Um, and uh, am, I, am I, how's my audio, Evan? Am I, am I breaking up at all? It's a or little good? choppy, but the, it's still coming. Yeah, you're you're breaking up, but we can make up most of it. Let me let me try and change my internet here real quick. Hold on. Let's try this. Hold on. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Is that any better? Audio is better, video is gone, but, or video is back. Okay, video is back. Okay, audio is better. Okay. All right. Um, so you've got, you've got this strategy of pretty infrequent surveys with a find all fix all approach. This is not the only way you could do it. You could imagine a much more frequent uh, survey approach wherein, um, only important leaks are fixed, for example. So you survey much more frequently and you fix big things quickly and you don't worry about small things. I'm not suggesting that that's optimal. I'm just saying that this approach of sampling very infrequently and fixing everything is only one way to actually think about the problem. Um, you know, so older technologies include things like EPA method 21, which basically is a highly sensitive PPM meter uh, on the end of a wand you walk around. Uh, and major point source of PPM concentrations looking for hits. So this is very labor intensive. It's quite straightforward and, and well established. Uh, I would say kind of the current, you know, what people do are these manually operated infrared uh, IR cameras, often called optical gas imaging. They give you an image that looks like this. These are a couple of helicopter images, a real time uh, simultaneous RGB and uh, IR uh, image taken looks like uh, August 31st, 2015 at 1.06 p.m. Uh, to be precise there. You can see here that this plume uh, in the bottom panel is not, at, not evident in the RGB, right? And so this is what the IR image gives you is it lets you see methane plumes. Uh, you know, I'd say it's moderately sensitive compared to method 21. Um, you know, and it's reasonably expensive. The instrument is 90 to $100,000. I think we paid $100. $102,000 for ours or something like that. So they're not cheap. In the future, you know, what are we going to do? There's a thousand ideas. How do we move beyond manual IR surveys? Um, you know, so with which method will win in the future? There's a ton of ideas, right? I mean, I could name, we tested 12 companies, uh, now 13, or no, actually now 11, 10, now 11 in the mobile monitoring challenge and extensions. There's a ton of ideas. Bridge of Photonics is a line path sensor. Uh, right, there's a ton of things going on, satellites. Um, this is just one idea. I'm not saying that it's the way to do it. It's just, I think, a cool idea. So we're calling it AOGI, Automated Optical Gas Imaging. So Automated Optical Gas Imaging aims to take Jacob, 
sorry, uh, and put them out of a job. Um, you don't want to, this is not socially useful to pay people to run around with cameras. I'm sorry, this is just not the way this should be done. If we want to solve the problem, it needs to be much easier, much faster, much more automatic than that. Um, so what can we do? We think we can bring the labor costs way down, partly by putting the survey rate way up. We can hopefully prioritize large leaks, uh, increasing mitigation efficiency, um, and re decreasing the net cost of mitigation. This won't necessarily and probably won't, in fact, increase the total amount of methane reduced, uh, but you could reduce, you know, only miss, say, 20% of the methane that a hand survey would miss. Uh, you know, so you, you, you know, you don't quite mitigate quite as much methane, but you, if you can eliminate 90% of the cost, that may be a trade-off you're willing to, to take. Okay, so why automate OGI? I actually applied to the ARPA-E monitor challenge with Rob Jackson at Stanford. I think it was about six years ago. I don't really remember. Um, to build such a system, we called it VIDEA, Visual Infrared Differencing for Emissions Assessment. The response, they didn't invite us for a full proposal. I'm still a little sore about it because I'm the type that holds grudges. Um, I didn't think it was a very effective response. And actually, this induced me to invent the FEAST model because I built a spreadsheet model that showed that it would be cheap. Um, their response was very, very short. It was like one sentence. IR cameras are too expensive, period. Proposal rejected. Um, th this is predicated on the assumption that if the detector is expensive, then the detection will be expensive. And I actually think that's a distinction that that's actually not logically correct. Uh, often to dissect if an idea is correct or not, you can push it to the extremes. What's the most expensive detector you can imagine? A $50 million, you know, EDF satellite that they're going to launch in a couple of years or a $30 million GHG sat satellite. That is the most expensive methane detector you can imagine. It actually may have per unit methane detected or per unit site surveyed costs way, way lower than anything else, right? Because it can see so many sites so quickly, right? And so there's a big distinction between how much a detector costs, my camera's expensive, right? And how much the actual detection event or the detection efficiency uh, is, right? And so I, I don't actually think that's true. Uh, and in fact, techno-economic models show that the cost of the detector is actually not that important and labor costs drive a lot of the costs. Um, another benefit of this, and one of the reasons I, I proposed this is that we had an IR camera. There we yeah, Adam, we lost you. But the suspense is killing me. So it's really, um, you know, it's really a nice, um, it, it's nice to have something that's that, to build off something that's, that's that mature, right? Because then you're not inventing the fundamental detection technology. And I actually think the higher resolution, like PPB scale surveys, you actually just don't need that to solve the problem. And in fact, that's just too much um, shine. You don't need that much shine on your, right, if that, if that metaphor makes any sense. Right? You just, it's, 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 you don't need it. It's not, not that useful to have high, high accuracy. So a camera may be just fine. Um, let's see, how's my audio? Evan, can you give me a thumbs up or a sideways or? It's mostly good uh, between we have an IR camera and I, I think we lost a few words, but I think that the, I think the point came across. Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, I live in the mountains now, so I don't know what to say. Okay, so this is largely work. This presentation is almost done, almost entirely by Jing Fan Wang, my PhD student, former PhD student. Uh, and then currently working on this is, is Yulia Chen, who's on the call. So, you know, how are we going to begin to do this? Here's some steps, you know, roughly as I see it. Uh, first, we're going to generate a data set. Uh, then we're going to model a detection, build a first model to detection from a single frame with a still camera. Then detect and classify, so size order these leaks from video streams, but still with a still camera. Uh, Techno-economic evaluation, these four were basically Jing Fan's thesis. Uh, then we want to move into detection from moving cameras. I think this is really important. This is what Yuli is working on. And then the field test of an integrated car-mounted system, I think, is the, is the last step. And then at that point, I'll kind of be done with the idea, I think. Okay, so data set. We generated a data set that we call GASVID. The, the idea was to, to generate sort of a controlled, uh, metered, uh, and sort of labeled uh, data set with things like distance and wind and, 
and uh, leak side. So we went to MeTech. You guys almost certainly know about MeTech. This is a controlled release facility associated with the Colorado State University in, in Fort Collins, Colorado. This mimics real world leaks across a variety of paths here. Uh, GasVid, we, our goal was to go out there and get a million frames of video, and we did. Uh, different leakage sources, so here's two uh, separators that we image, separator one and separator two, we called them. Uh, eight classes of leak sizes and five imaging distances. Uh, the, U, the metric there, 4.6 to 15.6, those aren't even, they were even in feet, but we, we should have done five to 15, but um, they were even in feet. I think it was, you know, I can't remember, 15 feet to something else. Um, so lakes range from, you know, pretty small, five to, to moderate uh, 2,000 grams of, of methane per hour, two kilograms per hour. So it's a pretty good leak. Uh, so this is just an example of kind of, you know, two of the, two of the sources. Uh, we did four total sources, uh, two separators, one wellhead, and one tank. And about a million frames of video, I can't remember what it came out to be. Okay, so see, here's some examples of what the plumes look like. These are from uh, separators. Uh, class zero to seven, we skipped some in here, but you can see class six and seven are pretty big and visible. Class zero is, is uh, no leak. Okay. Adam, uh, this is Matt Harrison. Yeah. Did you do it all against an emissive background or did you use all kinds of different backgrounds? Uh, these were, I think they're mostly against the sky. Yeah. I don't think they were universally against the sky, but I think the way it ended up being, they were kind of against the mix of the sky and maybe some other equipment. We didn't pay that much attention to it. We should have and mixed up the backgrounds. Um, we also didn't do in these initial tests, we didn't do much interference. We have a new data set from last summer or the summer before uh, where we had people walking in front, trucks driving by, uh, we were releasing cold air, uh, hot air with a hair dryer other kinds of confounding sources, a plume exhaust from a F-150, that kind of thing. So we have a confounding data set now, maybe that's another study we need to do, um, is use that for, for, uh, for gas vid. But this is pretty simple, still camera views, mostly against the sky, not entirely. Um, uh, and then distance is, you know, um, 15 feet to, to 50 feet. We didn't go closer than 15 feet because we want this to be automobile mounted. And so, you know, even five meters is pretty close to get in a truck. And so we want to we want to have a standoff distance. Let's see here. Okay. Oh, and then leak images by distance. This is the same class four leak uh, at five meters and 15 meters. So you can see at five meters, uh, the signal is much better. Uh, we step back. This is all the same piece of equipment. I think this is even on the same day. Uh, um, uh, you know, it gets quite a bit harder to see, as you might imagine. You're just working with fewer pixels. There's no other intuition required than that. Your signal is small because you don't have very many pixels to work with. The way we did it basically is we set the leak going and we would film for, you know, X minutes at a certain distance, then back the camera up, film for X minutes at that distance, back the camera up, then we change to a new view, you know, back the cameras up, right? And so we really just, you know, kind of systematically, we're just trying to generate as many frames of video as possible. Okay, so model one is plume detection, um, you know, and the idea was to train convolutional neuron as a common computer version technique uh, to recognize plumes. Uh, so what does a convolutional neural network do? On the left here, we have an input image. This is a set of pixels. These are number one to five, but you'd have a zero to 255 level of gray. You have something called a filter. A filter is basically like a miniature eye that scans over the image. And in this case, basically the filter multiplies, in this case it's uh, ones on top and zeros on the bottom. It does a, uh, it's called a Hadamard product, basically a product sum of, you know, this times this. Actually, let's just do it. Uh, yeah, basically it's the sum of, you know, one is what you get out of applying the filter to these four images here, or these four pixels here. Uh, the filter then scans across and creates this processed output on the right hand side. And it's basically scanning across the images. You have many filters that each one has learned, the properties are learned. Some of them are detecting edges, some of them are detecting brightness changes in the vertical horizontal direction. As you go deeper, you do many layers of this, they start to detect things like circles or cloud-like objects, right? And so this hierarchical processing, it's based, it's inspired by the optic nerve system. Um, and this is basically, you know, how it kind of uh, learns from rudimentary brightness changes to things like dogs or hot dogs or whatever. Uh, we don't need to worry about max pooling. 
Okay, uh, and then at the end, you pass it through what are called some fully connected layers. And again, each of these arrows is basically just an interaction term that has a strength associated with it. And these parameters associated with these interaction terms are learned. And in this case, we're trying to disentangle, uh, you know, whether this pitcher is a dog, a cat, a boat, or a bird. And we have a probability associated with each one. You have labeled images. And basically what you end up doing, you've got this image of a boat. It's scanning it. Uh, it creates a deep stack of processed layers uh, associated with these filters. And then it applies, given the weights on the fully connected layer, basically it generates a probabilistic output at the end. This is done in an iterative fashion where its accuracy is tested uh, on the training set, because the training set, this would be properly labeled as boat. Uh, it would basically go back and be adjusting all the weights such that it eventually learns how to recognize and assign a high probability to boat in this case. So all the, all the image recognition, you know, Google recognizes what something is in, in an image. Uh, that's, this is, these are all CNNs, right? And so we wanted to apply this pretty standard technology uh, to method detection. Okay, so we realized really, really quickly, I mean, this is like a month in, that image pre-processing before training is super important. It's very hard with a black and white image to recognize the plume if it's against, especially because our images were from so many different angles and different pieces of equipment, it was really hard for it to do anything. So we wanted to extract the foreground, uh, the plume, and take out the background, okay? So we wanted to localize the plume and then just feed the plume in there. So we tried three different uh, methods to do that, fixed background, moving background, and mixture of Gaussian. Uh, so here's our original frame. It's a methane plume. Uh, the fixed background method basically says, I'm gonna take a sequence of frames from the start of the video when there was no leak present, the class zero. I'm gonna average them, let's say 10 frames and create a, this is the background with no plume. And I'm gonna subtract that from every image that comes to the future and say, this is what's different, therefore this is what's changed. The problem with that is here, you can see in frame B, I've got highlighted in red, a cloud has actually entered the frame between when we categorize the background and when we're doing this particular frame subtraction. So you get this big signal here. Moving background basically says, I'm gonna average the last 10 frames, subtract that from the current frame, and that's gonna subtract out anything that's static, and the only thing that will appear is what's moving. A uh, mixture of Gaussians is the right one. That's a standard background subtraction technique from the literature. Both moving background and mixture of Gaussians, as you'll see, work pretty well. Fixed background doesn't work very well. And you need a static image with no plume beforehand to train the background out. And so we don't think that works very well. So moving background or a mixture of gradients work well in a static camera caveat. So we'll get back to that. So this is what we want to train on here, right? We don't want to train on this raw image. We want to train on here's a cloud, right? So they can learn to detect clouds and then in the second paper, detect their size. Okay, so here's a bunch of details on the convolutional neural network. I can send you the paper. Uh, not interesting for a, uh, for a, um, uh, uh, you know, a talk like this. Um, uh, yeah, also details, sorry. Okay, so how do we do this? You want to be really careful about test sets versus training sets. 80% of data from our separator from pad two is set to a training set. This is what goes in that iterative loop as it's learning the weights on all these thousands and thousands of little connections to recognize things. 20% of that is used in an internal loop called validation. Basically, that's to compute a score separate from the very tight inner loop, it's sort of the next loop out and say, I'm gonna compute a validation score and watch that drop. And when that begins to level off, I'm not learning any more from my images. The test, you wanna never introduce the test during training. It's something totally different. And so in this case, we took data from a separate, a totally different separator and from a whole different set of angles and, and sort of backgrounds, right? And we said, okay, it's never seen anything from separator one or we could do the tank we're gonna basically you know, feed that in as our test, right? So it's never seen anything like that. All the results here are on an essentially a new piece of equipment that it never saw during, during training and validation. So our sample sizes are of order, you know, um, looks like we've got maybe 20,000 frames per distance um, uh, size combination, something like that. Okay, so we tested a bunch of different things, sorry. 
Okay, so what do we get of no background subject? Let's take a look at this, uh, at this here. We have a, a binary choice here, and we're just trying to say yes, no, did it see a leak or did it not? We fitted a, in the test that we fitted a mixture of 50% yeses and 50% noes. So 50% of the time it got class zero. So just the, you know, the piece of equipment there with nothing, nothing to be seen. Um, and 50% of the time it got a leak, okay? So here's our probability of correct assessment. Uh, if it's just guessing by random, it's gonna be right 50% of the time. Yes, I saw a leak, no, I didn't see a leak. Yes, I saw a leak, no, I didn't see a leak, right? So this is the blind man's approach to, to leak detection is 50% of the time is a leak, 50% of the time is not. Okay, so um, at very close, four meters, that's blue here, and at very big leak sizes, it actually can see something, interestingly. Um, you know, it's not great. As you get very far, 15 meters, 12 meters, you know, the performance degrades. At very small leak sizes, you know, it's 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 really randomly guessing essentially. So no background subtraction is not particularly useful. We realized this very, very early on. And so we spent we spent most of the time not worrying about the convolutional neural net. We're gonna do computer vision. And then we spent all the time worrying about background subtraction and pre-process before the CNN ever got it, uh, which was, you know, this is how this goes. Um, uh, so here's uh, the three different methods. Here's no background subtraction, which you just saw. Here's the moving average, and we'll just we'll just highlight that. We can see that as we go to the larger leak classes, we're between 90 and 100% accurate at saying there's a leak or there's not a leak. Uh, and really, anything above a class three, we're above 85%, even at the farthest distance. It's very correlated with distance, so it's almost monotonic with distance, it's accuracy. Uh, and at the closest distance, almost any class, it's got a 97% or so accuracy, okay? So this is really, um, this is really, you know, I think, you know, you know reasonably uh, impressive kinds of results. Fixed average doesn't work as well, neither does, does MOG. So we think something like a moving average, which again is this rolling average, uh, is kind of the way to do it. Okay, so we think for a moderate size leak, three and above, you're going to be able to tell whether there's something there with a computer like that in a fra small fraction of a second, whether or not there's a leak there with 90% accuracy, okay? That really is actually possible, okay? So this is not just, I mean, we fed it images that it had never seen before from a piece of equipment it had never seen before. I think yes, no detection, I think with improvement, this is a grad student did this. Jing Fan's super smart and works super hard. That guy works like incredibly hard but like it's one grad student. With a little bit more effort, I think you could get yes, no detection from a video stream at 95%, no problem. Okay, so that's just yes, no. Do I see a leak or do I not? Uh, let's see, oh, this is three, or three or four different model architectures. So there's a little bit of difference with the model architecture. Again, I can send you the paper. Uh, a little bit difference in how you train it and how you pool the images from different tasks together. Uh, again, that's in the paper. Uh, sorry. Okay. So paper paper two, which is we're just about to submit. That, that one's published. This one's just about to submit. Jing Fan, you know, his wife had their first baby. He got a job at a startup. Um, you know, life goes on. Um, uh, okay. So we say, you know, can we um, process a sequence of images instead of a single image? So actually CNNs can be stacked. You can process a whole layer of images. It's called a 3D CNN. Or you can use uh, methods that essentially have a feedback loop kind of built in where you're referencing back to prior sort of detections in previous frames, uh, recurrent neural networks or uh, what are called uh, LSTMs, long short-term memory um, uh, sort of techniques. And so we were trying to get at these embedded sort of sequence effects. Uh, you know, why do we, why do we want to know the size? So this is actually, so this is a different problem, detection and classification. So this is yes, no, do I see a leak? And then how big is the leak? Okay, so why do I want to do that? In, in our paper with, uh, with um, Garvin Heath and, and Dan Cooley, we pr propose this 550 rule. 5% of the leaks cause 50% of the emissions, okay? So we want to be able to tell the big guys and ignore the rest, okay? So we want to know how big it is. Okay. Okay, same thing. Uh, now we're looking at segments. Five frames, 15 frames a second. 
60 frames and 100 frames. We want this to be fast. I don't want to sit there with the camera out of sight. I want this camera moving. So I don't want to take a minute of video to find out what my issue is. Six seconds is, because it's, it's going to be scanning across the equipment, pause, take a second, take a second, take a second. We don't want to spend a minute on each set of frames. Okay, so we're going pretty fast. A uh, bunch of model architectures. Don't you guys love this where I can just, <laughs> yeah, that's a bunch of details, <laughs> you know. <laughs> All right. Okay, um, so a 2D CNN, this is, you know, pretty straightforward, right? So you can just say, I'm going to just feed in 15 frames of video, a second of video, one by one, and generate 15 predictions, and then say the most frequent prediction is the right answer. A 3D CNN feeds in a stack of it, a stack of images here, 15 images deep, and then processes the whole stack at once. Okay. Uh, convolutional uh, LSTM basically processes the images, and then there are these uh, conv LSTM cells that basically apply some operations to each output of the convolutional or the imagery layer. And then basically each one has some memory terms that pass along to the next one and you get your output out at the end, basically. So you might say hit, 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 hit. And then by the end, if you still are at hit, yes, or you're still at class seven, right? And so it's sort of iteratively updating as it watches one image at a time. So that's different than the stack CNN, which is really processing it's sort of its view as a cross time. It's sort of viewing this, you know, this extended uh, image, whereas this one is, you can think of it as viewing the images one at a time and then iteratively updating image, 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 right, and honing its prediction as it moves through the 15 images. That's really the way, the way to, uh, to view it. Um, and, okay, so we tried three different classification schemes. One was our eight class classification. We had eight leak sizes. Can we go zero to seven and correctly say what class of leak it was? Okay, those are seven discrete sizes. We just had them pop them at, at you know, one of seven levels. The other one is three classes. And we just basically group them into small, medium, and large leaks. Okay, this might be good enough. If all you really want to do is find out where the big leaks are, you don't really maybe need to know this. Maybe this is good enough, right? It's a much easier problem, actually. Okay, so if we're guessing one out of eight classes by random, we'd get 12.5% correct just by chance, right? We're at something like 40% in our best model, accurate at setting it to the, um, to the right class and not actually differing very much on the models. This is kind of interesting. It's a common result in, in um, AI is that the model architecture often is secondary, interestingly. You just have to train it correctly and it learns the proper weights given the structure of its brain, so to speak, right? And so it's actually less variable on the architecture than I thought, as long as you train it properly. Okay, some variation, but not, not huge. Uh, this is called a confusion matrix. This is useful to look at here. And so here is the truth, zero to seven, what we actually fed it. And here's its prediction. And a perfect model would have all instances right along the diagonal. If you feed it a seven, it would say it's a seven. If you feed it a zero, it would say it's a zero. It's really good at seeing, you know, when there's not a problem. And it's pretty good at a class one. And down here, it sort of smears them all into, you know, classes four and five. So it's not very good at discerning those, okay? I equals J is right along the axis about 40% of the time it gets it right. You can do approximate classification as well, like how, how much was it between one, you know, plus or minus one on its class, right? And it does better at that, uh, right? But it's not, you know, it's not great. And particularly down here, it just sort of smears them all together can see nothing, it can see a small leak and discern it from nothing. Once it gets big, it says, well, it's in this general oatmeal pot of big leaks. I can't really tell. That's kind of what it's telling us. Uh, it's really good at the zero one. So these were those numbers from that, that sort of uh, creaming chart where it was getting better and better as the leaks got bigger and bigger. And video gas net, the multi-frame one, it goes to 100%. So that's kind of cool. Okay, the three class is much better. We'd expect 37.5 because of the way our data set was structured by chance. We're getting, um, pushing about 80% correct classification at a small, medium, large. 
So I'd say, you know, with some effort and additional training, additional data sets, maybe you could push this to 85 or 90. So what can we say now? We can say that it can detect leaks with, I, I think, in excess of 95% easy, yes, no. It can also give you a small, medium, large reading, 80% or so, maybe even better, correctly classify the size, okay? So if you have a still set of videos, this is done. I think this problem is kind of done. Okay. Um, now, if it's moving, it gets really hard because you can't subtract out the background and it can't focus in on the cloud and then it gets, ooh, it gets bad really fast. Okay. So techno-economic analysis, I just have a few slides on this. It's in Gene Fan's thesis. I can send you his thesis. It has these two chapters that aren't published yet. Um, uh, we use the, what's called the FEAS model, which I'm not going to go into, but basically it's a techno-economic assessment model that says, I'm going to feed this technology a bunch of leaks and see how good it is, um, you know, at, uh, you know, at uh, solving the problem, how cost effective it is, what fraction of leaks does it find, and it sort of simulates the behavior of a detection technology. Okay. Uh, in addition to the probability of detection, which was uh, in FEAST already, we had to do a probability of visibility. So if we're in a truck, we had to say, given, and we looked at a bunch of well sites from the, I think we looked at the Bakken and Eagleford region, we said, given uh, the driving distances and these safety berms that are around tanks, for example, or other pieces of equipment, how close could we get? And then we said, given how close we could get, we applied the, uh, the proper detection probability chart for that distance, right? And then over a certain distance, you know, we said it's not going to be able to see anything, okay? So we, we actually had a probability that it was within a given, a given leak, given this, you know, what are the equipment is, is sort of would be visible from a particular piece of, of real estate, right? And so that was a kind of a hand analysis. Ideally, you do some field tests as well. How close could you get to things? Uh, the cost of program, we think we can drop the cost of program by 90% uh, or so, 13% as the residual. Um, this assumes an automated driver. The other way to do this would be to say, I'm just going to attach this to a truck that's going out to the field anyway. Let's say my company has 100 trucks, I'm going to put this on 10 trucks. No additional labor costs, the guys are driving around to fix things anyway. This just tags along. Maybe occasionally it says, well, no one's been to Site 57 for a while, drive over to Site 57. But basically, it's just opportunistic. So we basically took the labor costs to zero. Okay. And that's the, that's the deal there. So if you get a sort of zero incremental labor cost, we had labor for, you know, the post-processing and running the computing systems, but we eliminated the cost of the, of the actual site labor and assumed it was opportunistic as the guys visited the sites. It would just be always watching, right? Sort of the eye in the sky, okay, or the eye on the truck. Uh, our emissions reductions go down somewhat. We only mitigate maybe 80% of the emissions that we would otherwise. Okay, 70 to 80%. So we were less effective at finding emissions. But the actual net cost of mitigation ends up being, you know, in some cases, the net cost of mitigation is negative. That is, we save more gas than we spend. Uh, but in most cases, it's positive, but much, much smaller. And that's because our value of saved gas now actually can make a dent. The value of saved gas in a, in a hand IR survey is very small compared to the cost of the survey. Here, the cost of the survey is so cheap that your value of saved gas actually starts to matter and starts to offset that. So our net cost of mitigation goes very, very small. And I think this is a robust result. Okay, so techno-economics says, and I just have a, like two more slides and then I'll, I'll for questions. Then I've been going fast. Techno-economics says we want to move fast because labor costs are so expensive. If this is a system that can detect plumes in motion, there's no additional time. Even if the guy's driving by a site, it'll be in the GPS tuned towards the site. Oh, hey, he's driving by site 57. See if you can see anything from the road, right? It just simply captures moving pictures and processes them. But background subtraction is very hard on a moving image. So my initial proposal to ARPA-E was called VIDEA, Visual Infrared Differencing. And so basically, this is a two-eye approach, and it's going to flip back and forth between them. So the IR camera catches the methane, the RGB camera catches everything else, and we difference them. So Yulia is working on this right now. We've got some field. We've got, got an um, a iPhone or GoPro strapped to the top of our camera in a stable orientation. So here's the GoPro image. Here's the IR image. And then Yulia already, in like a week, because she's amazing, 
uh, did all the trigonometric uh, transformations and pixel you know alignment basically so we can basically say okay i'm going to subtract these two overlay these images get their views to be the same and subtract the two uh, with the hope that we can see signals that are in the FLIR uh, but not in the not in the um, the visual image and that'll basically allow us to even if we're moving this plane is flying we're doing a survey with uh, scientific aviation in the Gulf of Mexico, the plane flies at 150, 200 miles an hour. Um, uh, something like that, I can't remember the airspeed. Uh, you know, you, you can subtract it out because both cameras are seeing the same thing, right? Shh, you just go around and you subtract the background using the visual. So it's hard problem, I don't know how good we're gonna be able to get at the background subtraction. This is where it gets hard, but if you can do it in motion, this would be super cool because then you don't need a pause. Um, you don't need to disturb the driver. He's just driving to, to various sites. You don't need to have him stop for a camera view. Okay. Okay. Future work. Yeah. Future work. Um, oh yeah. So here's from the last time we got a worker. He dressed in cover, coveralls, a fake worker and is banging on things with wrenches. We had hot air, exhaust from a truck, driving car. So we got a confounding data set we need to work on. Uh, and then here's the people who are actually doing things. So this is really fun. It's fun to go out to Colorado and, and release gas and uh, wear hard hats and stuff. So at any rate, um, thanks. I hope that wasn't too fast. I hope it, you know, made some sense. It's hard to know. It's all in my brain, so it's hard to know how fast or slow to go. It's kind of a whirlwind. Um, but happy to answer any questions, send you papers. Please steal my idea and turn it into a company. Um,